Uh, uh, how many of you attended the C++ course at the start of the week? Uh, basically everybody, except for Alessandro and Christopher was teaching the course, so that's okay. You're reasonably confident with C++, aren't you? Yeah. Well, this is great. So you've all had the introductory C++ course. Um, I, during, the, during today and tomorrow, we're going to talk to you about HPX, and at some point we've got some examples. We'd like you to compile them, we'd like you to run them, we'd like you to test them. And so I have accounts for the course set up on Daint. If you pick a number, make a note of the login and the password, and then cross it out and pass it on to the next person. Number one, I should point out, I've already installed and compiled everything on there, so you might, if you're really lazy, want to pick number one. Ah, no, you can't. Okay, you guys have to start at number, like, four, and you guys have to start at number eight, okay. and you guys have accounts anyway. Um, so if the person who gets course number one gets everything pre-set up, because I did that before we started to make sure things would work. So fingers crossed everything will work. And I'm kind of curious. You all are interested, obviously, in C++ because you've attended the C++ course, but the HPX part of it, I'm kind of interested to know what level of knowledge you have of HPX already. I mean, has anybody used HPX already in the past? Nobody. Okay, and Giovanni is not here. I've just realized one, one chap is not here, Giovanni, and he has used HPX, so he's the only one. Okay, so this is interesting. So are you interested in HPX mostly because you, you just want to find out more, or you seriously think you might start using it for a project in the near future? The first. Okay, I suppose that's true. You've, you've seen HPX, you've heard about it, and you've thought, I'd like to give it a try, I'll go to the course first. That would, that would summarize people's, yeah, mostly. Okay, I'm curious. And that looks like Giovanni just turning up. Okay, so um, we've taken a slightly unusual approach with the slides for the tutorial. So if you're, fa I mean, everybody's familiar with Git, I presume, and checking out things from GitHub. We've created the slides in GitHub markup, and we've put them in a Git repository on GitHub. So you can actually clone the repository if you want, and you can view these slides on your laptops. And if you, if you see these two links at the bottom here, these are the links that will take you to the this one is the GitHub I.O., which actually loads the slides into your browser and displays them as a slideshow. And this one is the link to the raw repository where if you wanted to clone the slides. And in the repository, we have the slides split into the eight sessions of the two days. And we've also got the examples that we'll ask you to compile and test, which are in a little subdirectory. So you'll have to clone the repository probably this afternoon or tomorrow anyway. But um, if you... Uh, if you want to do that now, then go ahead and do it. But if not, we're putting the slides on the screen, and you can just watch and enjoy. And I'll give you a moment to do that whilst I, uh, whilst I talk. So the presenters are myself. I work here at CSCS. Um, I'm kind of specializing in task-based programming, in particular HPX. And Thomas here, Thomas Heller from Friedrich Alexander University, has been working with HPX since about 2010, 2011, something like that? Yeah, and, did, and it's the, basically the subject of your PhD thesis as well. And about, I don't know, half of the code in the, the HPX repository was written by Thomas one way or another, maybe not half, but it's a lot. And there's basically, there's nothing, there's very few questions that you can ask that he won't know the answer to. <laughs> so when you do ask questions, I'll just pass over to him. And hopefully most of the... I'll, I'll do fine, but when I fail, he'll take over. And, uh, and um, when we do some of the uh, examples this afternoon, Thomas has got some really nice stuff to show you, which it stretches your knowledge of C++ in some places because, well, I have to say that the way Thomas writes code and the way I write code is like, 
he grew up programming template metaprogramming stuff, whereas I've learned it as an old person. And so uh, for me, it's a bit more, <laughs> a bit more scary. But, <laughs> but your, your, um, your stencil example is really nice. And I'm looking forward to seeing what people make of it. Let's see. Did you stand up for a reason? Or? Um, he asked me to. Ah, to an introduction. For the camera, Thomas. <laughs> Um, did anybody get as far as cloning this stuff or checking it out or typing it in? I can move on to the next slide, can I? Um, incidentally, if you, if, you, if you do have the slides on your screen, then you just basically use the arrow keys to go backwards and forwards. Um, and I'm not, I'd be interested to know if it works because this is the first time we've tried this. And by, by the, the idea is that by doing all of the slides, inside the GitHub markup, the GitHub markup language and putting them into a repo. It means that you can check it out. You've got access to all the material. And also, all of the, all of the little tips and tricks that we put on the slides will be basically searchable in Google. And so when people are looking for how do I build on Daint, they'll hopefully find this material and they'll just see all the slides with the stuff on. We've got two days, eight sessions, and we've broken it up into, I'm going to start doing an introduction this morning, which is really... I learned HPX in a similar way that you guys are learning HPX. You don't know much about it. You're interested in it. You start programming it. And as one year turns into two years, turns into three years, you think, oh, if somebody had told me that when I started, it would have made the understanding of some of the other things so much more easy. So during this first introduction, I'm just going to give you a very high-level view of what's going on in HPX. Because for me, it makes, it makes understanding some of the code a lot more obvious, and it also makes, it makes understanding of what you're doing wrong a bit easier to, to understand, because you realize that some of the things that you do don't work the way you think. And when you understand how the mechanism underneath is operating, you think, ah, I see why it's not working. So during this first overview, I'm just going to do, it's scheduled from 9 till 10.30. I probably won't talk that long, because Thomas's second introduction is actually much longer. So I'll probably stop after 45 minutes or maybe less, maybe more. It depends how we go. And then we'll, we'll go straight into session two, and then we'll have a tea break and carry on with session two. And this afternoon, we're going to get you to build some HPX examples, to run some examples to see how to set options, how to find out just generally all the things that make a program start and stop and that kind of thing, because there's an awful lot of options in HPX, both when you build it and also when you run it in terms of printing out information of what's going on. Tomorrow, we're going to go over, Thomas has got a very nice stencil example where you start with a serial program and then you turn it into a serial, you turn it into a multi-core version and then you turn it into a distributed multi-core version and you just see how you, how, you, how you progress from just writing a simple for loop kind of thing, which does a stencil, turning it into a parallel stencil, turning it into a distributed with ghost layers, that kind of thing. Then the second session, um, a little bit on resource management in terms of how you stop your program kind of blowing up and overrunning the system and taking up too many resources, that kind of thing. Things which, things which aren't obvious initially. But again, once you've seen somebody else do it, you think, ah, OK, great, now I, now I understand. Then in the afternoon, we're going to do debugging. And debugging HPX applications is much harder than debugging normal applications, for reasons we'll explain during the next couple of days. And the final session tomorrow afternoon, we've left this basically open, because it's Friday afternoon. A lot of you will want to catch the train. And if during these two days you think, OK, I understand what you're doing, and what I would like to do is this, but I've got no idea where to start. How would I do it? Then that final session, we can work over some examples, and we can go through some of the stuff that's in the repository, show you what's going on, and hopefully answer any sort of lingering questions where you think, OK, I understand the basic ideas, but how do I do this? And move on from there. Um, so I'll start with the introduction. And, yep, and I'll do a full screen just to get rid of some of the and almost full screen. So this first introduction is really just uh, what is HPX and what's it doing and why is it interesting. And then second introduction will give you a more of a detailed look at the actual API and how you write programs with it. And the difference in HPX and 
just normal C++, is really this lightweight threads. In HPX, you're writing task-based programs, and each task is a little thread. It's a piece of code which runs, and you try and break your code up into thousands or even millions of these little tasks, and how they interact with the operating system, how they interact with the runtime, and how you write your code with them. It kind of changes the way you write your code, so I'm going to go over lightweight threads, and also just what is the runtime actually doing? At what point does your code kind of stop being your code, and where does the runtime take over? And there's a, it's a, it's, there's not a, there isn't a, you know, a fixed line where this happens. And I'll give you a quick tour also of the HPX repository, just so you can see where the things are, where you should look for help, where, you know, where the examples, that kind of stuff are, and things like that. So lightweight threads. Um, everybody knows what a thread is, I presume. You have a CPU, it has cores, those cores execute instructions, and when you create a thread, you're basically saying to the operating system, reserve me some, some, some space and give me a time slot to execute this code in. And when you use C++ with standard threads, you're creating a thread which is managed by the kernel, managed by the operating system, and they're reasonably expensive to create and destroy. When you create a thread, you have to create a, there's, there's a whole lot of gubbins that goes on in the operating system to reserve memory, to reserve, um, it, it puts you into effectively an operating system queue where you get polled at regular intervals. And setting up those threads is quite expensive. So if you can avoid creating and destroying and creating and destroying constantly, operating system level threads, you save a lot of resources in terms of time. And so what HPX is doing is when you start up your program, you have eight cores, 16 cores, whatever it is, it creates eight threads at the operating system level, or 16 threads, depending on how many cores you've got. It creates one thread per core, and it binds them to those cores. And then on top of those threads, it then runs a little lightweight scheduler in fact, it can be quite heavyweight, but it runs a scheduler which then runs your tasks. And your tasks are running on those operating system threads, but when one of your tasks finishes and the next task kicks in, there's no, the underlying thread is the same. It's just the instruction pointer which points from one task, it gets to the end, and then it points to the next task, and it gets to the end, and it points to the next task. You don't have to go through the whole process of creating and destroying these low-level threads. You only have to go through a much more lightweight experience, and that's why they're referred to as lightweight threads. And so your code is running inside what we call an HPX thread, but that's really running on an operating system thread. This means you have to be a little bit careful with some things you shouldn't do. For example, if you call certain operating system level functions which actually block that operating system thread underneath, this can cause problems to the runtime, and I'll mention that again. Um, and the advantage of lightweight threads, obviously, I've just mentioned, is that you get a much faster switch from one task to another. When your code finishes running, and then you kick in the next task, effectively, all you have to do is like call a function, and also, if, okay, there's, there's two, two scenarios. One is if you're, if you're starting a new task, you effectively just have to allocate some stack space for the local variables and change the instruction pointer. When tasks go into suspension and out of suspension, then there's a little bit more work because you have, to, you have to save the contents of the instructions and the registers in one place, switch to another task, and then when that one comes back in, off you go again, and there's that flip. But the context switch is much, much cheaper for the lightweight threads than it is for an operating system thread. And the real big difference, or at least it, to me it seems like a big difference, is that the HPX tasks are not preemptive. So the operating system, when you create operating system threads, if you create eight threads on an eight-core machine, 
then each one will run on a core. But actually, the operating system has probably got 100 threads of its own doing all the other stuff that goes on. You, you've, you've come across the concept of jitter going on in the operating system. The operating system is managing tons of stuff. It creates hundreds of threads. You create eight more. Now, your eight threads are doing most of the work, but those other threads are constantly being, your eight threads are constantly being stopped. The operating system does something, and then you're resumed, and it stops another one, and it resumes, and you get a time slice. And if you have a task-based program written with standard threads, you can get into a situation where you could create 100 or 1,000 threads. And the operating system has to actually manage those threads at the underlying level. And it's freezing one, putting in another, freezing one, putting in another. And it's giving you a time slice. Now, if you say, OK, stop that. We just have eight threads for eight cores. And we run our lightweight tasks on those. HPX will never preemptively halt your task. So your task runs from start to finish, and it doesn't get interrupted. Now, the thread that it's running on, the actual operating system thread, it can still get suspended. But the HPX doesn't suspend your tasks. And this is important, um, really, because there are certain guarantees with, a, with, with an operating system thread giving everybody a time slice. There are certain guarantees, like you know that all these tasks will complete at some point point, even though it may, it may slow your system down by having too many of them. Whereas with HPX, you have to be perhaps a little bit more careful about not, um, uh, I'm, I don't know the, the phrase I'm looking for is, but you, you can't necessarily guarantee that if this thread blocks waiting for something and some other thread is guaranteed to run, it will unlock this thing for you because that thread might also be waiting for something else which is blocked. And so you've got to be a little bit careful about the deadlock situation, which you might... What I'm trying to say is there's some, some things you can get away with on an operating system thread that you probably can't get away with on an HPX thread. It's a bit stricter in that sense. Um, you correct me if I've... No. Okay. Um, and because, because you're doing little lightweight tasks, what you want to do is you want to make them quite small because... If you make your tasks very, very long, so you do 20 seconds of some calculation, and you've got eight of those 20 seconds of calculation running on your eight, your eight worker threads, the CPU will be fully utilized, and it will do all of those calculations going on. But there may be smaller tasks which need to run with maybe some urgency, because this thread that you're running, this task that you're running, might run for 20 or 30 seconds, and it might need to send some data somewhere else. Now, if it sends some data somewhere else, and on the other somewhere else that you're sending data, all of the cores are busy doing these working, working, working threads, because nobody is going to interrupt those threads and pull the network, or interrupt those threads and get something from somewhere, basically, some of those tasks, they go into the queue and they have to wait. So you want your task to be quite small. I, I've got more, more on this. Um, so the runtime, essentially, this is a very simplified view of it. You have a number of sockets, NUMA domains, and you have a number of cores. And on each one of these cores, you've got an operating system thread, which is the HPX worker thread. And the worker thread instantiates a scheduler. And the scheduler is responsible for putting the task, actually executing it, doing the context switch, running it, and when it finishes, saying, done, clean up, next one on, and picking from the high priority queue and the low priority queue, and picking whether something, and, and managing when a task is suspended and when it's not suspended, and that kind of thing. And when you create tasks, you have executors which tell you where to put them. Thomas will go into that in more detail. But essentially, you have a picture which looks like this. And you create tasks using these calls. You put them onto executors. They go into work queues. When they're ready to be executed, then the scheduler will actually run them. And it's the executor which is responsible for controlling where this all goes. And one thing we don't have at the moment is a very nice resource manager, which allows you to, one thing we'd really like to be able to do is say, right, we've got four sockets on this machine. I'd like to reserve that socket for this part of my algorithm, that socket for this part, and keep things consistent. You, you have to do that by hand at a quite low level. You can do it. And we really need something a bit more, a bit more fancy. And I, I, 
I left that on this slide because I, I'm hoping that at some point somebody will volunteer. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping that next year we'll get an intern or someone who can work on this. And so if anybody has got students working with them who want summer projects. Um, so in a sense, HPX is very similar to something like OpenMP or TBB, but there is a big, big difference. As, uh, amongst all the other differences I've already mentioned. When you come into an open, OpenMP parallel region, you say OpenMP parallel 4, and you execute this loop on n threads, and then it gets to the end of that, you have this region. Outside of that region, your code is basically just, it's normal code. You do this, you do this, you do this, and then you put a pragma parallel 4 region, and then you come to the end of that region, and you get nice parallel speed ups. In HPX, there's no concept of a parallel region. When the program starts, Everything's in a parallel region. It stays in a parallel region for the whole duration of your code, and then it, when you terminate, it, it stops. And so everything in your code is a task. Even int main becomes a task. So int main becomes a task, and within int main, you say, do this and do this and do this, and when that completes, do this. And I'll come to that in a moment. But the runtime is always active. Uh, and in TBB, you can say, do this bit in parallel, and then you can drop out of the parallel. Same in OpenMP. And this, this, it has quite serious implications for the way you write your code. And of course, you can manually start and stop the runtime if you really want. And the only time that I've actually needed to do this, manually start and stop the runtime, is when I've got a benchmark, and I wanted to compare OpenMP, TBB, and HPX all within the same compiled binary so that I was sure I had everything exactly the same. And then I start and stop each one and do that. But I can't see a situation when you'll usually want to start and stop the runtime because it's like once you've bought into the HPX framework, you have to really buy into it 100%. You can't just have half your program running in HPX and half your program running normally. Well, you, you, you can do it, but you wouldn't, there's, there's no reason. You wouldn't gain much from it. But having said that, HPX is only a library. So it's still C++ you're writing. It's still just normal code you're writing. So how is it that this framework somehow takes over your whole code and turns it into this whole parallel thing? And it's really because although HPX is only a library, it's basically re-implemented a huge amount of the standard library. When, when, that's why when you look at the HPX code base, it's just terrifying, because there's just so much stuff in there. In fact, the scale of what you've taken on, <laughs> I say you, I'm, I'm sadly part of it now, but the scale of what's going on in, that, in there is it's frightening, because the whole futures, mutexes, locks, um, what else have I got up there? The idea of the schedulers, the executors, there's even, I mean, Thomas will show you a lot of material later, which has got all the different things you can use. They all interact in a single unified framework. And once you start writing your code on that unified framework, it, it's really, um, it's really a, a big change. And that's why one of the questions that I put on the initial slide is where does your code stop and HPX, or where does HPX stop and your code take over? Because once you start having parallel loops and you put your lambdas in them, I mean, your, it's your code in there, but it's running inside this, this other wrapper, which does all the sort of synchronization and the management for you. Um, so you create tasks, and you want to synchronize your tasks so that when this one finishes, this one runs, and when that one finishes, that one runs, and this one can't run until all of those ones are finished, and this one can't run until that one is finished, and this one is finished. And you want to do that, and you want to write the minimal amount of nasty low-level mutex code all the kind of synchronization, putting barriers in. What you want to do is you want to write just the most simple, when this does this, then do that. When that one finishes, then do this. And that's pretty much what HPX gives you. But sometimes you do need something a bit more low level. And I've got an example, which is it's called latency, where I've implemented a very simple little algorithm with a whole bunch of different ways of controlling it. And you can break the system. And so, Paying attention during a course like this really, 
it took me a long time to understand how these tasks interact and, and, how, and how you can not break the system. You need to be a little bit careful. Um, and so that's basically why we're doing this course and this introduction to give you a bit more of a top level. Futures are the main synchronization. Futures in the standard library, I'm assuming you've all heard of a standard future and you're familiar with standard thread. You do some work and you get, a, or you, you ask for some work and you get a future back to it. And futures effectively are an object which allow multiple threads to communicate with each other through a state which is either ready or not ready. And when you say, give me the result of the future, it says, I'm sorry, not ready. You'll have to wait for it. And this is the real difference with the futures in HPX and the futures in the standard library. Because in the standard library, if you say, give me the result of the future, that thread effectively says, sorry, can't give you anything, and it will block on that future. Whereas with HPX, you say, give me the result of that future. And what happens is it says, I'm sorry, that future's not ready. And it will just suspend that task and say, not ready. And it will immediately switch in another one and get on with that work so that you've so that ideally you just keep the cores busy all the time. Um, and the, the futures in HPX are extended with what's referred to as continuations. So you can say, instead of saying future get, you can say future then. So you say, when that future becomes ready, then just do this. And then you attach pieces of code into the continuations so that you don't have to explicitly wait for something you schedule something to run at that point. And that's why the scheduler, the futures, all of the synchronization mechanisms that go into it, they're all tied together so that, so, that, so that it just works. And if you write your code using this sort of syntax, then you pretty much don't have to worry about any of the low-level stuff at all. And your stencil example, I think, it only, in fact, you hardly even use, you don't even use async, do you? Um, You're using mostly just parallel loops and OK, but, good. Um, yeah. So if you keep your code basically clean like this, you can go a very, very long. You can, you can do 90%, 90% of the work just using a very clean syntax where you say future this, future that, do this, do that, when this, when that. And you'll get away with most of it. And it's only that last few percent that you have to worry too much about, um, too much about uh, you know, the, the low-level synchronization. And so when you do a task-based program, and I apologize to someone like Will. I made this up completely. So this has got nothing to do with reality. <laughs> but you, you say, my task is to solve tomorrow's weather forecast. OK, so task number one is solve tomorrow's weather forecast. First thing I have to do is I have to load in my initial data, the boundary conditions. I have to do this. I also have to set up a whole bunch of grids. But of course, I can't set up the grids until I've loaded the initial data. And whilst I'm doing that, there's a bunch of equation of state things that I can set up independently. So I'll initialize those tables. I create the grids. And now I need to initialize the atmospheric model and the ocean model. And that's a task. And you create these tasks. Now, you already write your code like this. The difference is that where these arrows come in, you're doing function calls. You're saying, call this function, bump, And then you're saying, call this function, bump, And your arrows are kind of implicit in the way you write the code. So that you call a function, and then maybe you'll call another function. And very few people are writing thread-based code where they say, right, spawn a thread where I sort of initialize the grid. And then I'll set a, continue, you know, a CV, a condition variable on that thread so that when it completes, then I trigger this and I do that. I know that the bulge chasing type code, that had that stuff set up. So everything was done with p threads and condition variables to wake up threads. Very few people are doing that. The normal code just says, do this, and then do this, and do this, and do this. And it's a kind of sequential set of steps. And it can have parallel stuff, and it's all done with MPI, and people signal. Where HPX changes your, changes your mindset is it forces you to write your code in a kind of task model so that you say, Solve this, and when that's done, do this, and initialize that, and load that. And so each of the steps that goes into your code, so your int main, your int main can just be the initialization of the first task, and it calls a single function. And that function, when that runs, just creates more tasks. And each of those tasks creates more tasks. And you get this explosion of tasks. And each one of these big boxes 
may contain millions of little mini tasks because you can take a parallel loop over a 3D grid and you can break that up into thousands of little individual tasks. And so the number that you actually get can quickly, can quickly explode. And the real aim is this is a trace of the version one of Thomas's, actually this is, it's not no version one, but here's an example where you can see quite clearly that the CPU is nice and busy, it's doing loads of work, and then this lot can't run until somebody over here has sent something to there, and you have these little wait states. And this is only a few you know, fractions of a percent maybe, but when you run that on one node and that on another node and that on another node and you get to 100 nodes and 1,000 nodes and 10,000 nodes and you have all these little weights, those little weights are all cascading to make up quite big weights so that the whole efficiency of your code might be down less than 50% or whatever. And the idea with HPX is to make your tasks small enough and to make enough of them so that, okay, this one runs and this one runs and these ones have all run. And instead of having these ones waiting, you want another 10,000 of them down here which don't have to wait because they're doing something completely different. And then the scheduler will simply say, okay, this one's done here, and it will stick something in here. And that thing might actually run all the way to here, and this one might be delayed to run to here, which might mean that these ones are delayed to run to here, but all these other gaps are being filled with loads and loads of other little tasks. And the idea is that you just, you just fill your machine with as many small tasks that you can, not too small fill the machine with as many small tasks so that all these spaces get filled up. And the scheduler isn't guaranteed. It's like this task is clearly important because these ones don't go until this one completes. Now, you can say certain tasks are high priority, but when something goes onto the queues, it runs. And when it completes, it will trigger the people that depend on it. And if you put loads and loads of tasks, this is why, when I mentioned earlier, if you make your tasks too long, then you can shoot yourself in the foot because the small gaps that you want to fill, you haven't got any small tasks to put in. You've only got big tasks to put in. And so what you're doing is you're putting a big task in here and pushing some of these out here. And if all your tasks are big, then you get left with big gaps in between as well that you still can't fill with any other small. And this is why small is good in terms of tasks. And the, the flip side to that is you don't want the task to be too small because there is still a cost. There's still a cost in terms of switching the context. Did I put it on this slide or is it on the next one? Um, I'll do the next slide because I think I mentioned it on that one. No, okay. There's still a, there's still a cost associated with the task. And as a rule of thumb, we found that if your tasks are something between 100 microseconds and a few milliseconds, then things tend to work quite smoothly. If you make your tasks too small, like if you have a for loop, you have a for loop and it iterates over a few thousand elements and it breaks it into 100 tasks, then each one of those things might only be running 10 of the iterations on the end. You know, you've, you've taken your for loop, which is 10,000, and you've got eight cores, and you break it into pieces. And if those pieces are actually very, very small, then the cost of creating a little task for each of those pieces becomes too high. And then this, this graph, this plot, I just mentioned one other thing is that when we talk later, these gaps here, there's, um, there's, there's things inside HPX called performance counters. And the performance counters you can query to tell you how much time the scheduler spent running tasks and how much time it spent waiting with basically an empty queue saying, I need a task, I've got an empty queue. And that's known as the idle rate. And in this particular plot, you would see the idle rate would be, I don't know, 20, 30% or something here, which is bad. We want the idle rate to be basically as close to zero as possible. And so when you run your first Hello World type programs and you print out the idle rate, it nearly always comes out about 90 odd percent. And you think, ah, oh, damn. But when we're talking about the idle rate, we're basically talking about the gaps between real work, referring back to this. So when you break your program up into tasks, you want to try and be more functional. You want to try and say, execute this, 
you need this and this and this and this as your inputs. You need this array of something. You need this vector of something. You need these parameters. Do the work. And when you're completed, give me back a future, a future which represents the result of whatever you did. And that future could be just a vector of numbers, or it could be a struct, or a class, or some more complex object. It could be a tuple, a tuple of a number of different things. And it comes back to you as a future. And what you want to really not do is have too many global variables, which this task depends on some global variable. Because as soon as you start having a global variable, you break that functional idea and you make it more difficult for the task to coordinate. Because now you have a global variable that multiple tasks might be accessing, and you have to put a lock in there. And then when you put a lock in there, you have to start synchronizing who's going to get access to the lock. And this breaks the model. So you want to go functional. You want to try and make everything depend only on what you give it, and it returns something back wherever you can. Of course, you can't always do that. It's hard. But you can go most of the way there. And when you, that, the picture I showed you with the, the arrows and the boxes, what, what's interesting about HPX is that when you run one of the big boxes, like solve the grid, it's a task. And inside that grid, you need to iterate over a bunch of cells and do some kernel calculation on those cells. If you use the HPX parallel for loop or the HPX parallel algorithm for doing something else, a stable sort or a partition or something else, it uses the same task framework to execute those little bits of individual code. And this is why it's so much easier to fill those spaces than you might otherwise think, because every big box consists of smaller boxes and the smaller boxes, and you just keep going down to the leaf nodes and the leaf nodes. And if you're using all of the HPX parallel algorithms as your leaf, so take all your just normal for loops and replace them with HPX parallel for, I mean, unless they're small. If you're just looping over you know, some small thing, you keep that inside a task. But that allows the HPX runtime to basically fill all those gaps and do all the work for you, and then you get your gains. Um, and it's really this unification from the very top level, int main is a task, right down to the individual iterations on a for loop are tasks, effectively. And it's all written in the same C, C++ API, which Thomas is going to tell us about. And I've already mentioned quite a bit about the task scheduling in the lifetime. And I've mentioned that we have a high priority and a normal queue. The schedulers can steal so that if you have a bunch of tasks on one work queue and the other one becomes empty, it can steal. You can control that. Because, for example, if you're running, if, if you specifically said, right, I've got two sockets, and I want to run all of the ocean on that one and all of the atmosphere on that one, and I want them to be separate because they have different data, and I want it to be nice and coherent, you can tell the schedulers. Effectively, when you create the executor, you have a template parameter which says what sort of scheduler you want to use. And you can basically say, I want a specific scheduler running on these specific cores. Do this, and don't steal. And I think there are six schedulers that are built in and of course, you can write your own one if you want, but you need to kind of know what you're doing a bit. OK, quite a lot. It's not documented, some of that stuff, as I discover to my cost. And there's tasks to be running. A running task, you know what that means. The instruction pointer points to your code. It runs. It's not running in a virtual machine. It's not running in some abstract. This, this idea of lightweight tasks, lightweight threads, you think, oh, it's a lightweight thread. Maybe it's actually running as a kind of, it's being emulated somehow in another thread. It's raw instructions being run on the same core as it would be running natively. You don't get any speed up from the sense that you're doing anything differently there. It's just a normal running bit of code. When a task is suspended, so if I say, do this, do this, do this, and the future that I'm waiting for, ah, it's not ready. HPX will spin for a fraction of a microsecond. And if it doesn't get that future, it will then just go suspended. It'll put you onto the suspended queue. And the next task that's ready will be pulled in. The next task that's in the pending section is pulled in. So tasks start out as being, normally you create a task and it's pending, meaning it's ready to run and it goes in the pending queue. 
As soon as it has to block on something, it becomes suspended, and the next pending one gets pulled in. Now, here's a catch, because let's suppose I'm suspended. I'm suspended, and then the task that I was waiting for says, OK, I'm done. That task knows, in its internal shared state, how many people are waiting for it and, and, um, and where they are, effectively. And you would think, ah, OK, this one is finished. It's going to wake up my task because I've been waiting for it. That's not quite what happens. What happens is your suspended task stops being suspended and goes back in the pending queue. And then when the worker thread gets to it, it gets pulled off and it carries on executing. Now, here's the catch is that you may have some nice urgent thing that's going, and it suspends. And then the thing which is doing its thing becomes active, awakes this task, and it goes back on the pending queue. It may have to sit in the queue for quite a long time before it actually runs again. So this is something which catch caught me out, because I was very interested in optimizing the network layer. And I find that if I do something on the network, any time when you're sitting in the queue waiting, the messages are building up in the network queue. And, 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 and the, the sort of why I wanted to mention this is because when you try to do things where you absolutely have to run, as soon as, as, soon as that finishes, you absolutely need to run, you, you, you really can't, you can't guarantee that you're going to run immediately unless you use a specific syntax in the continuations. And I'm not sure I should mention it now, but I'm thinking of the fork policy and also the sync policy. And we're going to come to that maybe this afternoon, maybe tomorrow. There are some, there are some things you can help encourage the runtime to promote one thread over another. Yep, question. No, uh, the, question was, the question was, if a task has to wait for something, doesn't it just become pending again? And the answer is no, because if something's pending, it means there are no dependencies that it's waiting for. It can run. So it doesn't have to wait for anything. But if something's suspended, it means that it either ran and it then had to wait for something, or there's a special case of suspended, which is known as pending. Uh, sorry, not pending. Um, Staged, sorry, there it is, staged, which is when you first create a task. So when you say, when this future and this future and this future become ready, then run this. That task gets created, and it's in a special staged state because it never ran. It hasn't been suspended. It's basically the same as suspended. It's still waiting on dependencies, and there can be multiple dependencies. And each, each one of these tasks effectively has a state internally, which the, the things that wake it up. Effectively, they, you can imagine I'm waiting on four futures, and the first one becomes active, and it becomes three, and then it becomes two, and then it becomes one, it becomes zero, and then it goes on to the, goes on to the pending queue. So the order is suspended? The order would be staged, suspended, um, pending, running, and terminated, I think. OK, so stage, sus so staged, suspended, waiting for something, that something is fulfilled goes to pending, back in the queue, then running, then suspend, blah, 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 until terminated. And then terminated. I got it. And it can flip between running and suspended many times. So if I say, do this, do this, do this, and when, when the file I.O. has completed, then do something, suspends at that point. File I.O., please do. So um, if, you, if you're um, working with the continuations that, that John mentioned, right? Those continuations don't immediately create a task and put the task to sleep again, right? So they just they just tell the the, the or, or attach the continuation, and the continuation is more or less just a function pointer that um, tells that future whenever you're ready, execute that code that might create a new task, right? So that's actually mentioned on this slide here. So when is the task actually created? It's basically created when that line of code is actually executed. Because when you say future.then, what you're doing is the compiler is creating the framework for a task which goes into that future so that when that future completes, then it actually creates that task. And that's confusing. Whereas when, when you, so when you, and if you have a future, then 
do something, and when that one completes, then do something, and you have nested thens. I, I used to think, I spent about a year thinking that all of these tasks were created effectively by the compiler, and they somehow went into some sleeping dormant state, and they were just waiting to be activated. But that's not what happens, because this task here, it doesn't get created when this future is instantiated. It only gets created when this future completes, and then it creates this task, and when that one completes, then this one gets created. So you, you're just chaining function calls onto the end of futures. But that's different, because when you do this, if I say this future is equal to another future with a continuation on it, I'm now actually creating futures. And if I iterate this from 1 to 10,000, I can create future number zero. OK, future number zero, you initialize with something up here. You say future number zero is when the I.O. completes, then do something. And future num whoa. <laughs> I have a meeting. I've got to go, sorry. What went wrong there? Uh, OK, there we go. So, so the, the first future you create, and then you say future number one, when future number zero does something, then do this. And then future number two, when future one does something, you can create tens of thousands of futures accidentally because you didn't quite limit, yeah? And I mean, tens of thousands of futures, it still works. But if you can avoid creating tens of thousands of futures because you know the 9,999 aren't going to run until the first one and then until the second and then until the third, if you can control that a bit better. And that's exactly what I'll mention tomorrow in the, in the um, I skipped a couple of, well, I've basically already said this. So the future is not ready. So it says, it's not ready. I'll suspend this task. It goes into the suspended queue. And effectively, when when the task that it's waiting on becomes ready, it signals that one, which then goes back into the pending queue. Um, and the same process happens when you try to take a lock. If you have to use a mutex somewhere because you have some shared variable that lots of people want to access, and you put a mutex around it, if I try and get that mutex and it's locked, it'll spin for a couple of cycles. And if it can't get the lock, it'll go in the suspended. And this is, again, you need to be aware that your tasks they basically just get, OK, I'm not going to waste time waiting for things off, bring in the next task that is ready. Of course, sometimes there'll be a case, which is exactly what we saw in that plot, where everybody goes into a wait state, and there's nothing in the pending queue. So you're in idle time then. And that's what we want to avoid. And that's why you want to break everything down to as small a task as you can, with as minimal dependencies on other things if you can. And this is the reason, again, why the whole of the standard threading library and the mutexes and everything have been completely re-implemented because you get all this suspension and reawakening and going on, on and off these scheduler queues. This is all built into it, and we mentioned that already. And we're nearly at the end of this intro. Active messages. With MPI, you send and you receive, and both sides know what's going on. With HPX, what you do is you say, on that node, this is, this is now we're talking about distributed active messages. If you're running on two nodes, you can say, OK, node number one, load the file. And when you're done, I want the contents. And the interesting thing is that node number one has its own workers, its own queues, its own schedulers. And you've effectively just injected a task into its queue it has no real knowledge of. I mean, nobody on that node said, load a file, and when it's finished, send me the results. You've just created a task, sent it to node 0, node, zero, node 1. Node 1 runs that task when the queue, it gets scheduled. Effectively, the message goes across. It gets decoded. It gets turned into a function call, which returns a future back to the other node. You can do some really weird things that you, you would never dream of doing with MPI, because you can just say, node 1, do this, and when you finish, do that. And node 2, do this, and when you finish, do that. And node 1 might send a message to node 3. Node 3 can send a message back to node And you get this kind of, it's, it's a kind of organic growth of tasks, which are, now, you normally don't write your code like that. You normally have an int main, and you say, everybody do this and exchange some data, and everybody do this and exchange some data. And normally, that's how you write stuff in MPI. 
everybody basically does the same thing and you exchange and you exchange and you exchange. But with HPX, you don't have to do that at all. And so, um, I'm not sure if I put it on the next slide or not. Yeah, you, I mean, you can actually run completely different binaries on different nodes if you want. So you can have a bunch of nodes which are dedicated just to a particular piece of an algorithm where you just, you just compile n functions. And as long as the node that invokes the function on that node uses the same, um, the same message ID effectively, because you have to compile the functions that are going to be invoked in all the binaries. But you don't, you're not forced into doing that kind of thing. Okay, you can do that also with MPI. You can have different binaries and different nodes. But with HPX, it's much more, um, it's much more pervasive because you'll see in the very first Hello World program that rank zero starts up and it just calls functions on all the other nodes. And the other nodes are just basically sitting there waiting for work to do. And it's this idea that everybody's just a worker. And there's no, there's no necessarily any, um, there's no special status in, in a way. And normally node zero is special because you have to choose one, don't you, to, to actually start the whole thing going. And one where you're going to send the output to the user and that kind of thing. And so this goes back, this slide, to the question I started at the beginning is where does HPX end and your code start? When you look at stuff like this, it's, it's insane. Yeah. OK, ignoring the boost range thing at the beginning, but this is taken from the Hello World. You, this bit, that's my code, but it's inside a parallel for each loop using a chunk size, and it's inside something else which is just a task. And you start to wonder, where does HPX stop? Because you're calling a parallel function, and you're just passing in a little lambda which is going inside it. And it, it just kind of gets worse the more of this code you write, because you become so dependent on, you, you'll be aware, I think, from the C++ course that the parallel STL will go into C++17. So you should, in principle, be able to write all this code in normal C++ and just replace standard with HPX for all of the algorithm type things. But because you've rewritten your program in this tasky kind of way, and you've used all the parallel algorithms inside all those tasks, and you want to avoid doing any management wherever you can. You want to not manage the tasks. You want to let the runtime manage it. And so your code becomes just these few lines in this much bigger framework of <laughs> craziness. And um, HPX is trying to implement all of the parallel ideas that are going into the current standard. So people are proposing new APIs and syntaxes for parallel ideas in C++. And HPX is effectively one of the proving grounds, if you like. It's like a test library to see how well all this stuff works. And that does mean that some stuff is going to change. So for example, there was a change to the parallel launch policies, I seem to recall, had their names changed, which you have to put up this kind of thing. And there's a, some executor changes and execution, policy. execution policies. That's the one I'm thinking of, launch policies. So things do change. And basically, the stuff that works should hopefully stay fixed in stone. And the stuff that doesn't work very well is liable to change. So if you start using HPX, you've got to be prepared for a little bit of pain in terms of it's a moving target. In preparation for this course, just to get the demos running, we've applied, I don't know, four or five, six little branch patches into the master just so that the stuff we wanted to show would work the way we wanted it to work. That's gone into the, I'm thinking about you know, direct actions, about the yeah. vector serialization, the other one of yours, the stuff of mine, the apex fixes. And so, so if you're going to adopt HPX, you have to be prepared for a little bit of pain, um, but hopefully not too much. And we're getting better. We're, yeah, we're getting better. And I like this quote from Alice in Wonderland because once you start writing your code like this, I find it very difficult to imagine going back to the way I used to write my code because it's, 
it's, it, it's, it's a very cool way of doing it, I think. Um, how long have I taken? I've taken an hour. Do you need two hours? Uh, the last, just, just go on as last slide here, I was going to give you a quick tour of what's in the repo just before we start, just so that you have an idea of what's what. Um, mention the IRC channel. Um, the mailing list for HPX doesn't get a lot of traffic. So if you send a question to the mailing list, like how do I do this or how do I do that, it might take a day or two to get replied to. And the reason why is because there's an IRC channel, the Stellar channel on the usual free node, and people like Thomas and myself and a couple of guys in America are pretty much logged into that. I mean, I have it running on my machine upstairs and it just stays logged in. So when questions appear on that, if we can answer them, we pretty much do it quite quickly. So I would suggest if you, if you start using HPX seriously and you have problems, then use the IRC channel first, the mailing list second, and if you find a real bug, then put it in the GitHub repo. And I'll, one reason we did our slides in the markup is we can click on these links and they should take us directly to there. Um, and if you've, um, the first thing, if I were starting to write my first program in HPX, the first thing I would do is I'd go to the examples here. And you'll find a whole bunch of examples in here, and there's actually quite a lot of them, because things like this quick start folder is actually a folder containing a whole bunch of simple examples. Now, there is a caveat to this, which is that some of these examples were written quite a long time ago. And because the API for HPX has got more and more sophisticated and more and more cleaner, you'll find that some of the examples, in particular the Hello World example that's in here, I think is terrible because, because it uses this idea of components. When you invoke a function on a remote node, basically you want to say, on that node, invoke this function. That's fine. If it's, a, if it's a kind of global function which doesn't need any extra information, like do this on that node, great. It does it and everything is happy. But if you wanted to invoke a function on a remote node and you had a class on that remote node and you needed to effectively pass a this pointer onto the remote node, so you want to say invoke this function on the remote no node in the context of this class, like if you had five file readers and you wanted to invoke, read something on one particular file reader, you might have a class, file IO, something or other, and you'd want to effectively create an HPX component, which is like a wrap around your class, which registers the this pointer in such a way that you can kind of hand it around between the nodes, and you can say, execute this function on this object on that remote node. And so you'll find that some of the examples in here are written using these fancy constructs that actually you don't need half the time. Because for Hello World, the example we present today... Hello World example doesn't have a component in there. It, oh, okay, well, maybe that one might, might have been cleaned up. I seem to recall that it had a... Um, it's still awful, but it doesn't have components. It's still awful, but it doesn't have... I thought it, I could have sworn it did. It, um, it's a big Hello World. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's why I say it's dreadful, because you've got... You've got the Hello World, which runs on all the worker nodes, and then you've got the Hello World, which runs on the master node, and then the master node goes through all this... OK, it's mostly comments. And then it goes through a thing, and then you've got the int main, which actually starts it up. And OK, it doesn't have a component in. I, I, I forgive. I apologize for that. I mis, 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 misread you. But OK, this is still 158 lines. OK, admittedly, 100 of them are comments. But when you look at that as your Hello World, you just think, OK, I, I, I've seen enough. Move on. <laughs> And so when you look at some of these examples, bear in mind that some of them, if you look at the dates, the dates, um, if you were to go back to, if you were to go to, uh, what am I looking for? Um, I'm looking for this one here. If you look at the date line for the GitHub, you'll see that some of the examples were written here. And this stuff, this is a lot of code. I mean, you can see here there's 16,000 oh, there's 16,000 commits, and just in this last two or three years, the API has changed quite significantly. So, so bear in mind that some of these examples are a lot more wordy than they need to be. They're, you get ideas from them, but when you think this is this is nonsense, then post a message to the chat, chat channel or to the mailing list, and you know, and find or find another example that does something similar. And that's why basically why I wanted to quickly show you some of these. Um, 
yeah, the problem is that as the code base gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes harder and harder and harder to maintain all of the old examples. And there's a lot of them. And there's, um, just looking at the names will give you a pretty good idea of what half of them are. But also, the tests. You need to know that the unit tests are really quite marvelous. There's a lot of tests, and they're broken into subcategories. So each of these folders. So if you want to test something like the serialization, that's too low level. You want to test, give me an example of a good test. Parallel algorithms. You want to test a parallel algorithm. Um, I want to know how does the sort algorithm work? How can I use it? Skim down there. All of the parallel algorithms are documented. OK, sort by key. There's one. This one was one of mine, so I know it. And you can look through the test. And, and these tests actually are pretty comprehensive, because what they do is they test you can test something running asynchronously. You can test running something. You can, you can specifically block, and you want to test for that. And you want to test what happens when the algorithm throws an exception to make sure it handles it properly. And you also want to test it if somebody uses a boost iterator, or if somebody uses a normal iterator, or if somebody uses a raw pointer. So the tests have actually got a ton of cases. And each one of these cases might have a specialization. So the tests are actually quite complicated, but they cover a lot of material. And one of the things that's different, maybe, in HPX from other libraries is that Things like exception handling. I mean, I've never seen anybody take so much care as Hartmut on over exception handling. I mean, the average programmer, hey, if it throws an exception, big deal. We'll just run it again and fix it next time. In HPX, every algorithm has to be exception safe, because this is basically like a, an implementation of the standard library, all of those algorithms. And it has to meet those kind of quality requirements, because people are going to use it for serious work. And um, from that point of view, it means that you can write programs that also, you can write a distributed program, which if a node goes down, in principle, you can say that node has gone down. I sent a message to it. You don't just seg fault and die. You get an exception thrown because the message handler says, I couldn't communicate with that node. It'll throw an exception. You can catch that exception. You can then resend that message to a different node. Or if you know what data that node was working with, you can maybe make a copy somewhere else. You can, you can actually write proper code that's fault tolerant in principle. Nobody actually has. But we the framework. Have, we don't have a network. OK, the, the network layer needs work and all that. But, but the <laughs> point is that in principle, the, the point is that in principle, everything is exception safe at the very lowest levels. Um, oh, I'm still in the tests. Uh, I was going to zip down to the root. I probably shouldn't show you some of the internal stuff. but. The two main folders, HPX is where all the headers go, and source is where the code goes. And I would say that about 90% of everything is headers only in HPX. It's, there's, there's, there is some C++, but the majority is all headers. It, would 90% be accurate, or more like 70%? Or? I, I don't know. Anything. Well. But I'm not, yeah. And you'll see in the examples that we show a lot of include HPX, local, LCOS, mucus, uh, mutex, things like that. There are folders like this particular one, where LCOs, local control objects, this is where the internals of all of the futures and the threading type mechanism, the synchronization go in. The local control objects is basically the synchronization mechanisms. And you don't want to dive into here too deeply, but you want to have a basic idea of what what exists, because you'll see these headers. And this is where all of the low-level stuff goes on. And so when you're creating, I mean, you'll need, at some point, you'll need a mutex. And when you don't know what to do, you'll find that there's things like spin locks implemented in here. And I don't know how to help you with this, other than to say, when you have a problem, you send it to one of the lists. But when you look at the examples and the tests, You'll see all these headers in there, and you'll just have no idea why they're there and what they're for. And if you, if you spend half an hour or an hour just browsing through this stuff and looking at it, just to give yourself an idea of how, how everything fits together, because all of this synchronization material goes on in here. And, um, and likewise, there's other folders which have got things like components and actions and stuff like that, and uh, performance counters. And I think I should stop at this point. Um, and hand over to Thomas. 
No, no, because I'm, I've got to the end of the slides. Oh, the HPX docs. I've got to quickly mention the docs. The docs are generated. You'll see that this is version 1.0. The last version, the last version that was released was 0.9.99, with a kind of, and it was 0.999 as a way of forcing the next version has to be one, because this is the, you saw in the commit history, the project was started back in 2007 or 8 or something like that. It's 10 years and they still haven't released a version one. And that's because it has to be kind of perfect. I mean, <laughs> the standards being set on things like exceptions and everything are quite high. And it has to be good enough to get to reach one version. But I think the plan is to get version one out around about supercomputing time. Am I right? Something like that, yeah. So around about supercomputing, version one will go out. So in, in the future, isn't the C++ library going to replace HPX? Some parts, yes. Some parts will, you'll effectively say, OK, this part of HPX we don't need anymore. Just replace all the HPX colon colon with standard colon colon, and now, boom, it's gone. But that's probably not going to happen until at least C++20, because some of the threading mechanisms that were proposed for C++17 have been voted out. They won't go in until at least 20. And until that happens, you've probably got more to say on this, have you? Um, I can. So um, um, yes, that would be awesome. If the C++ standard would be able to replace HPX, that would mean that we would have reached our goal, I think. Um, but um, even then, um, what we have is still just an implementation of that version of the standard library, right? So you, it, it's the, you, you still have different implementations of the standard library. You have Microsoft, you have um, the LLVM implementation, you have the GNU implementation, um, et cetera, and so on, right? So uh, what, what we have is still just one implementation of many, right? And you have different quality of, of the different implementations, different focuses on the implementations, right? Um, different extensions, and, and uh, everybody does some experiments with new features and stuff like that. So we still have, um, there's still use for, for library like HPX. Does that answer your question? OK, so just the docs are generated pretty much from the code. There's a, a bot that runs at night after somebody commits something, and it updates the documentation. So this particular link, actually, that I, this, this link here refers to the GitHub HPX docs, and that's compiled on, a, on a, like a daily or a nightly basis. But if you were interested in the docs for a particular version, then I think some of the links in here probably take you to the, the sort of the branch point Oh, that's not, that's this one. I want the one before that, 911. So that would be the docs as of that particular branch. So if you checked out... Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Anyway, you can get the docs for a previous version, but why bother? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tutorial for getting started. Then down here is where you find some of the more interesting actual stuff. Like, OK, you need to know how to launch, and, but we'll show you that today. Down here, the components, which I, I avoid using whenever I can. And then... Parallel algorithms down here, performance counters. The performance counters, you need to have a browse through that just to get an idea of what's available. And OK, I'm going to stop and hand over to you. And uh, what time is this break scheduled for? 10.30. Uh, 10.15 10 or 10.30? 10, 10 no, go, go for 20 minutes, and then we'll have a tea break, because otherwise you'll be doing too long. I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> OK, there's questions. Go now, and I'll answer questions. Microphone is there. there. And I'm not sure which one we pressed to turn it on. Do you know? It never works. OK, go. So one of your first slides, when these threads that you were explaining, so what is, what actually is the lightweight thread you're talking about? Is it a P thread which is never destroyed, or it's a lower thing which is created by a kernel? The lightweight thread is just a function pointer, a bunch of arguments, and 
a saved state which represents the registers and things. It's, it's a context. So it isn't a thread. But when you say the HPX creates... Okay, so HPX... Eight threads on eight cores. Those are real threads like a p-thread. So it's, it will call a p-thread create or something like that. When the program starts, it creates eight p-threads on eight cores. Okay. And then those eight p-threads, they just stay for the whole duration of the program. And your tasks are really just like a function pointer with a bunch of parameters, and it calls those functions and executes them, and then it returns, and the scheduler is responsible for when, the, when a task is started, it has to switch the context for that. It's effectively a p-thread, yes. p-thread that is never destroyed. It's never destroyed. Because there is a lower thing in the kernel. Lower no, 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 no. The, ker the kernel manages the p-thread. But there is lower API to create lower level threads on the p-thread. Yeah, I'm not familiar with anything lower than that. But, I mean, a p -th is there something lower than a p-thread? A p-thread is just a kernel thread. When you create a p-thread, you're saying to the operating system, I need a thread, give me one. And the operating system creates space in its thread management system, and it creates a thread, and then it runs that, and it gives it a time slice. And that's what we're running on. Okay. But individual tasks are lightweight in the sense that you don't create any new this is threads. Clear. You just create this little space that you store your data in. and you. There are other threading libraries, right? So p-threads is just the, the POSIX API. There, there are other APIs for creating threads, of course. So, for example, uh, on, on your um, OS X, you have the Grand Central Dispatch, where you can um, do something similar. Um, or on Windows, you have all those create thread functions, whatever, um, stuff like that. But, but it, eventually, you just have to talk through the mic through the mic. Um, you, you just have to tell the, you, you, you have to use the APIs from the operating system. Right? So um, I think on the blue gene, you, um, you used to have um, a lower level API than, than POSIX, but you still had a POSIX layer on there. Um, but if you use Linux or any other Unix-like system, you, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of anything lower than POSIX. I didn't know the context. I just plugged it into some random oh. socket. I hope it was the, <laughs> the right one. Th there was another hand up prior to that. Anybody wanted to have a go? Oh, I have to give this to you. So it's, it's an easy question. What's the difference between what you can find on GitHub and what you can find on github.io? Is there a difference between the two websites? You have github.io and then you have github.com. Is it the same well, thing? The, when, you, when you create, I'll, I'll talk into this, keep talking for a second. When you, when you, when you create a GitHub a repo, you basically create a Git repository which is managed by GitHub and that does everything for you. Now they have a special thing which is you can create documentation in your re repo and then when you go to github.io thing, it loads that as like a web, so you can browse the repo through the web browser. And that's effectively what we're doing with these slides. They're, they're part of the Git repository, so you can clone the repository and you get the slides and you get the examples. But when you use the GitHub IO, you see it as a slideshow like this, which is kind of cool. And that's why we did it, just so that you get everything. It's a special feature of GitHub called GitHub Pages. And you can do it with all your GitHub repos as well. And you can create little wikis and stuff into your repo, which are visible through that. OK. You have to put this on. And I'll watch how you do it. So probably need the, the battery as well. Can I ask uh, another question? Uh -huh. Put it on your back. Um, along the lines of the uh, question of Anton, um, can, we, can we imagine that then um, HPX has, a, let's say, this uh, thread pool? and then just uh, dispatches the, the single task as uh, fibers on, in, inside those th threads. Thanks. That's, that's the right Thanks. method model. So, <coughs> yeah, fibers is, a, is, a, is effectively an equivalent, equivalent, it's, it, this is, you could call this fibers, yeah, and it would be automatically the, basically the same. Okay. The, the lightweight threads are essentially fibers, yeah. The echo is strange. Yeah. 
it's it's um, how they're implemented. Yeah, so it's um, yeah, it's just a function with a stack and managing all the registers that you need for the state of your uh, thread of control, and then you have a little piece of assembly that does the context switch. So that's it. Very very lightweight. So don't, don't you then have some, uh, some nasty problems because of uh, the, the memory protection? I mean, the two tasks, then they share the same virtual Now, if you create a new task, it has, a, it's a, it has its separate stack. It has its own stack. Every task has its own stack. Mm -hmm. They don't share stack space. But they share the other, other space. They don't share anything now. Oh, okay. So every every task has its own private state that includes registers, um, stack. Yeah. But if they run within the same thread, and when you switch between tasks, you basically just switch the the stack pointer. Yeah, we just switch okay. the stack pointer. But it's going to be in the same piece of memory. I mean. Uh, no, it's a, it's it's point. So when you switch tasks, you switch the stack pointer, and the stack pointer points to a different location in memory. Yes, but that task could access the memory of the other task, which was running within the same thread. So Doesn't you, it? You, uh, so you you might have nasty could, problems. Yes. You, don't, yes. you don't get a, a segmentation faults, but you get memory corruptions, and you notice that later. Correct. Yes, but but. Um, that it's no no big difference to to um, a regular program. It's I mean you can theoretically you could um, have any 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 address right and write to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. And, and you don't but know if it's if it has been allocated or not or it's it's undefined behavior if you do that if you just pass in any any address. Yeah. Sure. It. Sure. But so it, it's nice to get some early failure, you know, instead of memory corruption and notice the, notice the bug very much later. Um, yes. So I'm not... Yeah, you're right. We, we don't, we don't um, put any protection bits or so in the suspended or pending tasks. So you... You, you, you wouldn't notice if you um, write into it to another task's stack, yeah. No. Okay. If you, if you write the program correctly, that shouldn't happen. But, but like, there is actually a problem with yeah, stack overflow. Yeah, the, um, we, we, we will cover that a little bit in the debugging session. So one, one big problem you have with those models are stack overflows, right? So if you, I mean, stack, you, you can get stack overflows with um, your regular operating system threads as well, right? Um, but but with, with regular operating system threads, it's, it's far less common because you have an eight megabyte of stack space and um, that's huge, right? You, you can put a lot on the stack there. Um, and also the operating system might be able to allow for your stack to grow Right, so it's just giving you more pages for the stack, so you wouldn't even notice. That's um, the behavior on Windows. You can, I think I have to switch the resolution, right? Um, so in Windows, the stack can dynamically grow, right? Um, so you, you can put an infinite amount of um, Sorry. Better? 1280 to 720. That's it. No? Ta da. Sorry. That's why I wanted to have the break.
So um, to, to, to finish the question, sorry. Um, yeah, so stack overflows are, are a big problem, right? Because um, when you have those, those tasks which are small and tiny, you don't want to, to allocate a lot of pages to the task, right? So you just want to have very small stack space, like, I don't know, a few pages, right? But if you have a lot, a lot of going on, a lot of recursions and everything, you might end up um, using up too much stack space and run into a stack overflow. Maybe, maybe not. Mm. But there, there, there are mechanisms to deal with that, actually. I can mention that the stack, no, no, leave it on. The stack overflows are actually something which you pretty much, as soon as you hit one, your program bombs out, and you know then that you have a problem. And I'll mention that in the resource management tomorrow. I mean, it does happen. It, it, so, I haven't encountered a program yet which was well written in a sensible way which rode into another task's um, stack. That never occurred. Your own stack, sure. Heap, sure, but not, not the stack. 